titled my message today is, It's What We Need. It's What We Need. We'll come back to that in a second. Uh, many years ago, I was uh, going to lunch with some friends of mine here at work. And uh, it was back in the day when there was a Wendy's right down the street off of Voss headed towards Westheimer. So uh, it was my friend Dave uh, Riggle. I think my little brother Cliff was with us. And so we went to this Wendy's right down the street, got out. And we walked in, and we were about to order. And you know, in Wendy's, they have the, the guy or the lady with the microphone up there. And then you can kind of see, you know, right behind them is a little mini kitchen where they're, you know, making the burgers and the fries and all that. And so we were ordering. And while we were doing that, we noticed that the, the, the two cooks, these two young high school kids, one was on the fries, one was on the burgers, and they were kind of arguing. And pretty soon they started saying words, and one of them took a spatula and slapped the other one across the face. Yeah, and the other one threw off, you know, whatever his thing he had with, and they started getting after it and duking it out. And I was just watching it. Dave Riggle, being the hero that he is, leaps over the counter in a single bound, gets in between these two people who were fighting, and breaks up the fight. Now, I just learned growing up in South Carolina in public schools, let people fight it out. I... <laughs> I was just enjoying watching this fight until Riggle intervened to be the hero and bring the peace. Now, here's what's interesting. About seven minutes later, after the manager had met with them, the two guys were back by each other, cooking happily together again. <laughs> now, if that would have been two ladies, no, we're, no I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> but I thought about that this week, and, and I thought about that in the context of our lives. Because think about it, every single day, all of us are fighting it out. Maybe we're not literally fighting, but we're having conflicts. I mean, there are conflicts at work, always. There are conflicts at home. There are conflicts at school. We're always dealing with one conflict after another, and we need someone to jump across the counter now and then, and to intervene and to speak to us and to give us a word of peace. And to me, I look at, as, as, as 11, 11, I look at our worship service kind of like that. In the middle of, of, of a week where we're having conflicts and fighting, it's almost like God kind of leaps over the counter when we're here. And in the music and in the prayer and possibly in the teaching from his word, we hear God intervene and speak a word to us. So when we're here together, whether I'm the one teaching or Gary Thomas or Kurt Taylor, whoever's up here, a guest speaker, our goal is really to do a lot of things. But we desire that our teaching and our message really have three components to it. it, it first of all, we want our messages to be helpful. We want them to be helpful. You can go to a lot of places, listen to a lot of teachings and speakings and sermons, and man, it sounds great on Sunday morning, and you're fired up, and he's a preaching, and he's going... But come Monday morning, or when you get home, or when you open the mail and look at the bills, that's really not that helpful. So we want our messages and teachings to be helpful. Also, second of all, it's really important, we want it to be truthful. Truthful. We want it to match up with reality. And obviously our standard for reality and truth is God's Word, it's the Bible. But also we can find truth wherever we may find it. We looked at that last week. All truth is God's truth, no matter where we find it. So we want our messages to line up with how things really are the best that we can, and they'd be truthful. And the third component is so important. We want our messages and teachings to be encouraging. Encouraging. You say, why is encouragement so important? It's important because we live in a world that will beat you down. I remember when I was a little tyke, I learned the little rhyme, maybe you heard it too, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Wrong. Give me the sticks and stones any day. Slap me with the spatula at Wendy's. But a negative word spoken by the Wrong person at the wrong time can have unbelievable damage on our lives. And, and we live now in a time where this damage and this 
this, I don't know, this culture of criticism and critique and negativity is literally pandemic thanks to our good friends at the social media. It's brutal. So I said the title of this message is, it's what we all need. And what we all need is encouragement. <laughs> we need sincere, sincere, real deal encouragement because we all get discouraged. We all get discouraged. Everyone does. So one of the guys who's really encouraged me over the years, maybe as much as anyone, is a guy by the name of Paul. Paul wrote a good chunk of the New Testament, but for a long time, Paul was a critic of people who followed Christ. As a matter of fact, he killed and hunted down and imprisoned people before he had this dramatic conversion experience. But after that, he began writing letters to churches all over the Mediterranean world. Many of them, the people, most of them, were discouraged. A lot of them were suffering. A lot of them were involved in massive conflicts, and he wrote these words of encouragement to them. One letter, if you have a Bible, you can open it there. If not, look on the, the uh, screen back there. It's 1 Thessalonians 5.11 in the city of Thessalonica near Greece, and so we can call it 1 Houstonians. So Paul's talking to us. He really is, and I love this. It's at the end of this letter, and he's really passionate. He says, therefore, encourage Encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. Times are tough. Life is full of conflict. Life, power, pain can push you down. And we need to hear words of encouragement. George Adams said this, he said that encouragement is oxygen to the soul. Whew. Mark Twain, the great writer, said this, he said, I can live for two months off a good compliment. Isn't that good? Someone asked Truett Cathy, who's the founder and CEO of Chick-fil-A, they ask him, how can you identify someone who needs encouragement? And Kathy said, it's easy. They're breathing. <laughs> They're breathing. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're at the top of the ladder, the pinnacle of success, or you feel like you're down in the ditch and down in the gutter, or maybe you're somewhere in between, all of us, everyone needs, we all need encouragement. Encouragement. It's interesting when you look at the, the, the word there, and you know, the, the New Testament was written in Greek, and the word is paraklesis, and that means to come alongside. It's the same root word, we get the word paraclete, which means helper, which means advocate. That, that's the word used in scripture many times to refer to God's Holy Spirit. But a great definition I heard a while back of, of courage that really brings it down where we can see it says this, it says, to encourage someone is to pour courage into them. It means to pour courage into. So my question to you is this, who are you pouring courage into? Are you a person, are you a man, are you a woman that's desiring, that's looking, that's listening to the people around you, whether you know them or don't know them, but you're looking, like Paul did, to be a person of encouragement, to pour courage into them. Someone wrote down the six most encouraging phrases in the English language. Oh, by the way, you know, especially those of you who are single or dating, the six most discouraging words in the English language, I just want to be friends. Those are the six <laughs> most discouraging words. Here are the six most encouraging phrases. You ready? Here they are. Write them down. This is really deep. Ready? The first one is this. Dinner is served. We all got to eat. Second one is this. All is forgiven. Third Keep the change. 
forth, you've lost weight. <laughs> Five, I believe in you. Six, I love you. I love you. And there's a seventh phrase, a bonus phrase, and you can sum this phrase up really in only three small words. Al to <laughs> bay. If he doesn't encourage you, then you cannot be encouraged. <laughs> but we all need encouragement. All of us do. We live in a world and a time where people are starved for someone who can look them in the eye and affirm their value. And when they're down and they need a word and someone speaks that word of encouragement into their heart, into their soul, it can literally change their Life. Think about a time in your life, if you could, think about a time in your life when someone did something or said something to you that was encouraging. Maybe it was a coach, maybe it was a mentor, maybe it was a parent, maybe it was a friend, maybe it was a stranger, maybe it was a book you read or something or a text. But think about that, remember that. How did that make you feel? I can remember when our family moved to Houston back in 1978, and I was about six feet tall, 135 pounds. Those last four pounds were attributed to the acne, so I was very thankful. And so... I remember going into a class. I had a class, uh, the, the teacher's name, I still remember her name. Her name was Mrs. Ames. She was about in her late 60s. She had a blonde kind of B-52 beehive, you know, hairdo stacked up, yellow teeth, smoked who knows how many packs. It's back when teachers smoked, okay? And I remember in speech class, we had to give this, you know, first class of the, of, of the, of the year, and I'd never done it before. And I got up and I gave a speech, and I just, I don't know, I talked. I'd never really done it before. And after I sat down, Mrs. Ames said at the back of the room, now that's a good speech. It's like, great. And I remember as a, you know, a gangly, you know, sophomore in high school trying to adjust to a new city, not knowing a soul, that poured courage into me. I ended up majoring in speech in college. I can think back to a time a couple of weeks ago, uh, we were getting ready for a meeting here at work and a colleague of mine took about 20 seconds and just said a word of encouragement to me. I remember several years ago, a mentor of mine sent me a text on Father's Day, just very personal, very real, a word of encouragement, and I saved the text. Because when someone encourages you, when someone speaks that word of affirmation, that word of hope, that word of comfort, it sticks with you deep in your soul. Paul is encouraging us here and in so many other letters in the Bible to encourage one another, to lift each other up, to build each other up. Now, as great as Paul was at encouraging, Paul he would still be in single A ball if it weren't for his major league mentor, coach, Hall of Famer guy by the name of Joseph. Joseph is the guy who is the main encourager in the New Testament. Now, you probably don't know him by Joseph. You probably know him by his nickname. Look at Acts chapter 4, okay? Acts 4 verse 36 talks about this guy whose real name was Joseph and the impact he had. It said, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, Cyprus over there, not Cyprus here, a Levite from Cyprus, from the apostles, check this out, called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So this is right after um, the uh, Pentecost 
when, when God sent his spirit to live inside of believers and, and the church was exploding, thousands of people from all over that part of the world were coming into a relationship with God. And one of those guys who, who was already following was this guy they called Barnabas. His real name was Joseph, but he was such an encourager. He was so full of life and so about lifting each other up, they called him the son of encouragement. That was his nickname. What's your nickname? When people see you coming, they say, oh, there comes old son of um, sarcasm, son of cynicism, son of discouragement. Wouldn't it be great? It, no matter where you are in life right now, no matter where you are, that you can make that pivot and you can start becoming a person, a man or woman, who's seeking to sincerely encourage and lift up others. Now, obviously, some people have that gift. I think Barnabas had that gift. Paul probably maybe had the gift, but probably learned it through Barnabas. You see, remember I told you, Paul used to be not only a critic, but a killer of Christians. He has this radical conversion experience. He says, now I don't want to persecute Christ. I want to follow Christ. Well, all the Christians are already getting persecuted, thrown in jail and killed. They said, Paul, we don't believe you. And Paul's group that he was leaving, the, uh, the, you know, the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees said, Paul, we don't want you either. Paul was in no man's land. But there's one guy, if you look up the story in Acts chapter 11, who said, hey, Paul, I believe in you, I'll hang out with you, I'll work with you, I'll take the risk of getting thrown in prison myself, of being killed myself, because I believe in God in you, Paul. That was Barnabas. That was Barnabas. Yeah, give Barnabas a, a, a hand. I like that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Barnabas, one of the lesser known heroes in the Bible. But who knows, we may not be here if it weren't for Barnabas. If Barnabas would not have accepted Paul, who knows? He was a son of encouragement. What an example he's left us to follow. He went on many missionary journeys all over that part of the world with Paul, risking his life to tell others about God in Christ. God's word to us today, simple. Simple, encourage someone today. Find that person in your life, in your world today. Today. Shoot them a text. More than an emoji. Shoot them in a text. Write them a letter with pen and paper. Call them verbally. Look at them in person and speak a word of courage to them. The power of a word spoken from a teacher to a student, from a coach to an athlete, from a, a parent to a child, from a husband to a wife, from a boss to an employee. The power, the power of an encouraging word. We all need it. We all need to be encouraged. One of the great gifts that we have is such a gift is this book right here, this book. This is a book of encouragement. Look at what Paul wrote in Romans 15, 4. He said, everything was written in the past, was written to teach us, so that through endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we may have hope. God's word 
It's for us to read and listen to and apply and to let it steep, if you can remember that, and so that we can be encouraged. So that's why I turn to God's Word, and many people in here have learned to turn to God's Word time and time again, not just on Sunday at 11, 11, but during the week to ask God to speak, to ask God to give us that word of encourage, encouragement, of power and hope, hope that we can persevere and that we can endure. And really, isn't the gospel that? Isn't the gospel, you know, this world of conflict, this big mess, and God kind of leaping over the counter of heaven and coming down through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ showing us the face of God, living in our world, living in our pain, suffering, rising, dying, sending his spirit that we could have life, that we could be encouraged to follow him and to carry on. Isn't that the gospel? Well, I, don't, I just don't believe the Bible, you say. The Bible is myth or the Bible is propaganda. Well, if you're thinking that, I really don't know if you've read the Bible yet. Because if the Bible is propaganda, it is poorly, horrifically written. It's terrible propaganda if it's propaganda. You say, why? Because the Bible speaks so honestly and openly and candidly about the failings and the mistakes and the weaknesses of its so-called heroes. It doesn't cover everything up. It doesn't inject some Botox or a lipo into its characters. It just says, this is how it is. So... Barnabas and Paul have gone on all these different missionary trips. And one of the trips, Barnabas asked Mark to come with him. So they go on this missionary journey. They're away from home. They get midway into this mission trip. And Mark says, I'm homesick. I want to go home. And he bails. Time passes. Barnabas and Paul are having another mission trip. And Barnabas says, hey, he tells Paul, hey, I'm bringing Mark again. And Paul says, no way. No way, Barnabas. You know, Paul, Paul was a boss, man. No way, Barnabas. Mark, he, he bailed last time. He's a quitter. He doesn't have it. You know, you can't take him. So read the story. It's in Acts chapter 15. Barnabas and, and Paul get into a conflict. I mean, there are no spatulas or fists thrown, but they're, it's real. They, they conflict so much that they have to part their ways. So Paul goes on his missionary trip that way, and Barnabas takes Mark with him on his trip. Because Barnabas saw something in Mark that Paul didn't see. Even though Barnabas was the one who saw something in Paul and brought him in to the group. How's that for hijinks? But I wonder if Barnabas, man, I wonder if he said this. He said, you know, Mark, <laughs> I'm going to take you along with me on this missionary journey because I don't know, just maybe somewhere down the line, you're going to write a best-selling book too. And so, we get the gospel of Mark. And oh, Paul, the boss, is dying in a Roman prison. And he's writing that last letter. And he says at the very end, Can you send Mark to see me? 